Okay, if I can have everyone's attention, we need to get started. We have quite a few guests here today, as you can tell, including a film crew, <laughs> which is something we've never had before in the history of South Valley District, uh, South Bean, as far as I know. So, um, we have, we're going to start with a training, but before <coughs> Feel free to sit down for a minute. If you okay, want to. I will. Thank you. I don't want to have you stand there for. <laughs> All right. You're gonna, we'll have you turn it over to you in just a couple minutes. Perfect. But Trisha's here. She's part of Terry's team's training today. And I'll let Terry introduce her when we get to that point. But before we start, I wanted to have Michelle kind of explain what's going on and why we have um, a film crew here today. Well, first of all, thank you very much for accommodating us and um, letting us crash your meeting. Um, we are here doing a um, project with the National Consortium of Interpreter Education Training Centers. And um, they've received grant funding to do a specific uh, filming for vocational rehabilitation interpreting, um, which is a great opportunity. There's been three states selected, and uh, Minnesota, ourselves, and um, Boston. So we're fortunate to be a part of this project. Um, and what we're doing is we're taking a lot of different samples about what happens in vocational rehabilitation. So um, staff meetings as such as this today, and uh, we specifically have these dates for filming, so that's why you're lucky enough to have us here at your meeting today, because we're like, great, we, have, we wanted authentic stuff, so this is a real deal meeting that we just wanted to get what we really have. We've done one-on-one -on -one appointments, we've had stuff with job coaches and choose-to-work trainers, um, and we have some stuff with vocational evaluation this afternoon and so forth. So we've got a lot of good samples. And what's going to be happening is they'll take these, um, the footage that we have and they'll make a DVD set that will then go out nationally to um, interpreter education for edu education purposes for VR interpreting. Um, because it's kind of a specialized field, as you know, the work that you do is very unique. And so the interpreting of the work that you do is also very unique. So again, we appreciate you accommodating us. And we're just going to be here for the first um, presentation, for Trisha's presentation, and then we will quickly get our stuff and be leaving so for the duration. So um, we have some releases of information, or release forms, if you happen to be on camera. We're not going to be spanning the room as Doug is going to. It's not going to be spanning the room, but if you happen to be on camera or something like that, we might send a release form to you back just to have you sign so that we have that for our documentation. That's purposes. pretty. So thanks, Kim, and we appreciate you guys again for coming in here. Sure, thanks for being here. So now you know what's going on. So you probably won't be on camera, but if you want to, you can always try to get on camera. The changes we doing. Before we okay. start, we, I want to have us, I want to make sure we don't forget to do our customer service award. We do this once a month, and people can nominate each other for good customer service, and then the winner gets um, prime parking out front. So. Um, Kyle, would you do the honors? You usually do when you're here. So. That sounds good. You want me to read it too? Sure. Fix. Tom Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing a client with minimal notice to expedite services in the best interest of the client. Yep. Great. Nice job. Welcome back, Tom, by the way. Thank you. He's a newly married man. Yeah, I know, really. All right. Um, I'm going to turn the time over to Terry's team then. Okay, for some reason, Jeff is not able to dial in. I can try to see if I can get him. And he was going to do the introduction, but I have it here since I gave it to him. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Tricia. She uh, will give a short presentation. We'll have some question and answering session, and Tom's going to guide that. Um, Fernando will talk a little bit about his role as a, he's our liaison for DSPD, and then I'll just do kind of a closure at the end of that. So we welcome Tricia. We're very glad to have her here. Um, Tricia has worked for the Division of Services for People with Disabilities for nearly 12 years. She has been funded through the Medicaid Infrastructure Grant since 2008 and has had the opportunity to focus on and research what is happening nationally around the government <coughs> and people who experience the most significant disabilities. Tricia is the program administrator for the House Bill 45 Support Work Independence Program with DSPD and is representing DSPD in the Employment First Priority legislation which identifies DSPD, VR, DWS to prioritize employment for people with disabilities 
within service delivery. Outside of work, she does have a life outside of work. It's true. <laughs> she enjoys cooking, reading, and spending time with her family, including three crazy dogs. It's true. So welcome, Trisha. Thank you. Now that I'm sitting, I don't want to stand up. Um, is that okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you for the for the introduction. Um, again, I'm going to talk quickly about the Houseville 45 program, Support Work Independence. Kyle is my counterpart in, on top of all the other things that he does with VR, so um, I happily tend to make the copies and kind of get stuff ready because the fact that he's here sometimes is a miracle in my mind because of how busy he is. Um, I decided not to put the, the PowerPoint up, so if you could just have all of the slides that I'm going to talk about in your packet. Um, and while we have your while you're opening your packet, you have several handouts that you can refer to later. Um, you've got the, the PowerPoint, and then you've also got the flyer, the little colorful flyer. That's something that we are distributing to um, potential participants. So uh, they're getting sent that letter. I'm, I'm going to agency fairs and, and using this flyer. So it's kind of a real quick introduction to what the program is. Um, you then have a copy of all of the paperwork we use for the project. You also have a copy of the uh, tax credit that's specific to DSPD clients. And then you also have a quick intake and eligibility checklist kind of a thing. And that's a real quick eligibility kind of reference sheet for people for DSPD. So if you have clients that you think might be eligible, this could give you kind of a reference to see in terms of their eligibility or diagnosis. Feel free to copy it, feel free to use it, um, and we'll kind of talk about how you can check if somebody's on the DSPD waiting list a little bit later. So if you have any questions about the stuff in your packet, let me know. Um, really, you know, the objective of this program is overall to develop collaborative working relationships. And I think in a lot of ways we've done that. I probably instant message Fernando on a daily basis for one reason or another. Um, and he's always really quick to respond, or Lara, whomever. And so hopefully you understanding more about this program too, we can have even more collaboration. Um, and the other goal is to really provide seamless support um, for supported employment. So having that transition perfectly from voc rehab to DSPD without any interruption in that person's um, support needs. Um, we also want to talk about just the different roles that people have in this program. Um, that includes the community service brokers. My role as the program administrator, you guys know your role as counselors, and then the supported employment provider. So those last two we're going to quickly touch on because you know your roles really well. I just am hoping that you'll have a great understanding of what the service brokers are doing, why they're calling and bugging you, um, sometimes why they might demand information that isn't necessarily <laughs> appropriate. That's happened. Um, so just to give you kind of an awareness about what's going on with the program. We have a, a couple layers, as all committees and things do. Um, we have an executive management team, which consists of representatives from um, Voc Rehab and DSPD, as well as stakeholders. So we have some provider representatives. We have um, Legislative Coalition for People with Disabilities. It's a pretty big group that gets together, and we kind of talk about what's going on with the program, numbers, challenges, solutions, things like that. So here's a list of everybody that's on that team, the executive management team. And then additionally, we have our data people. So Stacy Cummings um, for VR, and um, Tyler Black is our data guy with DSPD. And then Jolene Weiler with the benefits planning program, as you guys all know, is so important, um, is also on this committee. So she kind of brings issues around, and, um, a, around benefits plan. We've done some data matches with her. Uh, for people who are in the project to see if they've had benefits planning, that sort of a thing. So we're really trying to make sure we cover all of the, the facets that would affect a person's life. I then have um, the list of the committee members. So Fernando represents your area here in the, in the South Valley District. And so then you can see who are the other district representatives. Um, so I won't really touch on that one. And uh, have you guys heard about House Bill 45? Before, has anybody, I know several of you have been involved in it in the past. We had, originally it was House Bill 31 um, when, it was a pri when it was a pilot project. And then, and that was in 2006. And then in 2008, it became um, a long-term program 
with a five-year sunset, and that was named House Bill 45. And then we came up with the SWE, or SWI, I don't like to call it SWE, but the SWI program, Support Work Independence. So that's typical, but I'll kind of refer to it as both, as House Bill 45 slash SWI, or the other way around. Um, so that was in 2008. Sadly, in 2009, we, DSPD lost all of their general state funding um, for all programs because of legislative cuts. And um, so we discontinued that in like December of 2009, actually. And so we had all these people, I think we had like 130 people that were employed, we were supporting, and we had to drop the funding. It was horrible, really, really horrible. Um, in 2011, Representative, or so I guess in the session of 2010, but for fiscal year 2011, Representative Manlove managed to get $150,000 of one-time money in the DSPD budget. Um, and so that was this last year. And I think it was kind of tough. People, you know, got attached to that one-time money, knowing what happened before. Um, and, you know, just kind of how much it takes to get a program going again. So we, we, I think we finished the year with about 70 participation agreements. The goal was being 100. Um, not all of those people were employed, obviously. But I think inside of all of those things, we, we did okay last year. Um, so now, this next with this new year, 2012, she added an additional $100,000. So we have $250,000 total um, to fund more people on the waiting list. And it's then she wrote employ the Employment First Priority Bill to actually protect the House Bill 45 money. So she wrote a bill to protect money for a bill. Does that make sense? <laughs> and it's actually much more than that. But So the money is protected, so we know that it's going to be long term. And so I think that I think I'm already getting lots of calls and people are kind of catching on that, oh, this is something that I want to participate in. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and what this means for you as VR counselors is you get to spend your supported employment budget. I don't know specifically what that title money is called. It's uh, our revenue 72. 71. 71. Okay. And, you know, Don, I mean, and originally that was the real focus of this of this project was to be able to, for VR to spend this money um, because I guess historically we, we, we spent a lot money back, turning money back. And so now, I mean, this, so, it, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those situations where we want, we want you to spend it, right? And I'm like the only person in DSPD that has money that we want to spend too. So it's kind of a, a little miracle situation going on, I think. Um, <clears throat> So what we've done this next year, this year is um, last year we kind of had people in the regions overseeing the program. It just wasn't working. We've taken huge cuts within staff at DSPD, um, and so we've, it's now all centralized. And I do all of it. I do the referrals. I do the send out the letters. I'm I'm managing all of the stuff. So if you have any questions, it comes through me. All the paperwork's coming to me. I know that sounds. I don't, arrogant maybe isn't the right word. It, it makes me kind of anxious every time I say it. But um, capacity-wise, it was really the only choice that we had. So what we have done is we use the community service brokers, and that's a service that we pay for, DSPD pays for, out of this house bill money to provide some case management in addition to going out, meeting with the person, explaining the program, getting the paperwork back to me so then I can then let VR counselors know that this person's participating. So they're kind of serving as a bigger role now, um, which is maybe why some of you have been getting some odd calls and you're not sure why they want all this information. It's because I am needing them to do some of that stuff for me so that I can administer the program statewide. So with that $250,000, you know, the average is still around $1,500 per person, and that includes the community service broker piece. So probably that's going to go up a little bit, but we're just basing it on a case-by-case -case basis. We've spent a lot more on some folks. We've spent less on some folks. It really just depends. And that's the beauty of this program is that um, we have some flexibility with that within reason. I mean, obviously, if somebody is never going to be able to achieve a level of independence, we, you know, we'll need to look at whether they're appropriate for this program or not just because of the limited amount of funds. But we do have some flexibility within that. Um, 
so the role of the implementation team, so Fernando and, and his counterparts in the other offices, is to um, you know coordinate with with management, with supervisors, be a technical assistance resource. So if you have questions about the case or what do you do with that Form 58? Does it have to be green or not? That question came up a while ago. <laughs> it does not have to be green. P.S. <laughs> I know. Again, that was a budget cut thing. It was like, really, we have to buy that special paper? Um, and anyway, so the form does not have to be green. Um, and so he's really here just to help you answer questions and be a resource. I've had him be a resource if somebody um, is being referred to the program and they haven't been to Voc Rehab yet. I'll kind of list his information as the contact person so he can kind of help them navigate through the best way, that kind of a thing. So, um, and then I kind of listed the things that I'm responsible for as the program administrator. I'm sending letters to um, participants on a quarterly basis, hopefully. We are going to be doing data matches. So looking at VR caseloads and DSPD waiting list and matching those and making sure we're reaching people. Because you don't always know if somebody's on the waiting list. When people are on that waiting list, they're not typically saying, hey, I'm on the DSPD waiting list because it doesn't mean a lot to them. They just know they're sitting there. So it's a way for us to identify people who may not be aware of the program. Um, and so we're going to be doing another one of those soon. And um, so I send those letters out as soon as we get that information back. They send it back to me saying whether they want to participate or not, and then a referral is generated. Um, and then as soon as I get back to that participation work, participation paperwork, I then send you the counselor a Form 58. So that lets you know this person's going to participate, um, they've committed, they've signed the agreement, that sort of a thing. Um, I've been sending all of the paperwork with that. A form 58 so you have their agreement and all that kind of stuff um, so the role of the community service brokers I talked a little bit about um, that they're doing somewhat of a case management piece so initially they get this referral for about this person they get their name their address basic information about their disability whether who their VR counselor is if I know if they're working with a, a CRP a, a rehab provider um, that information is included. Um, they go out, they explain the program. They're also still sp supposed to look at resources that could be helpful to them. If they haven't signed up for Medicaid, if they are having issues with their Social Security, getting them to a benefits planner. So they're not just going out to fill out the paperwork. They should be able to help with some resources and supports that could be a barrier to someone's employment. Um, helping them fill out e-pass applications, things like that. So they can be a resource to you as counselors. Um, as well. You know, if you're paying a job coach or you're paying additional money for those kinds of things, this is something that could benefit um, somebody who's in this program, and, and you as well. Some of the brokers are new to this, to this field. They've had experience, not necessarily with folk rehab, so if you're getting some weird questions or have some concerns, please call me so I can get them steered in the right direction. I had a call from a parent the other day who said, is it true that if I sign this paper, I can never be on the waiting list again? <laughs> and I said, no, that's not the case. So she was just taking some of the, the questions or the statements on that uh, participation agreement, literally. And this mother was really scared. So, I mean, it really was a matter of just perception and, and those sorts of things. So again, if you have any issues, let me know. Um, Again, just think of them as a resource to you. And if you are having issues with them, please call me because they really are supposed to be a support, not somebody who hinders the process or makes you crazy. How's that? <laughs> All right. I won't go into your details as counselors other than um, I, I've heard some issues that it's been a little tricky with the milestone changes as far as um, provider changes or you know, switching over to supported employment. Kyle, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Well, it, under the old program with the hourly, it was a little bit easier to know when somebody had dropped below 20% of intervention time. Now we're hoping that we're transitioning over to whatever provider change or anything else that needs to happen with DSPD before, right, right about the time we're paying, being billed for the milestone for the 20%. That's about when we need to be facilitating that change. Okay. Do you guys have any questions about that? Has it come up as far as when when we do that? So to clarify, 
after we they bill for twenty percent intervention, does that mean that we don't the R doesn't pay the milestone for? No, we would still finish okay. our milestones and that's where out. I think counselors are confused. We still finish our milestones out, but mm -hmm. what we need to be doing is working to mm -hmm. connect them with DSPD and whoever's going to continue those services so that okay. and I think that's where counselors get confused and I was talking to Tricia the, the amount of money that they have is really limited I think if they're on the waiting list they have like 14 hours or something a month and if they're on DSPD it's even less than that or it's about the average is about four hours a month which was kind of figured at that 20% mm -hmm. intervention level you know if they're going in an hour a week and the person's working you know whatever Hours. It seems like um, a lot of these folks are working 10 hours, sometimes less. But you know that that intervention level is around that time is is around that amount of time. We can go up a little bit if somebody needs a little bit more. Um, you know, for a little bit longer, that's fine. But that's kind of where the goal is: is that four hours per month. So it is very limited as far as. So VR is very critical for DSPD people <coughs> because they have long-term funding does not mean that you know we don't have a role long-term in their life we do and but if it just needs a little bit of tweaking DSPD is going to be able to do that uh, but they it's likely that these clients will you know come back through our agency again that we're not just dropping them off to DSPD we're going to be involved with their their case over their lifetime likely Hopefully we can salvage a job. Sometimes like five years later, there's a change in management. Need somebody just to go in and coordinate and collaborate. DSPD, perfect. Um, but if they need more than that, they're going to be back to D, into VR and we're going to start milestone and working with those individuals again. And that's why we have our SE money, right. which we want to spend. It's in the budget and we do want to spend and, it. And it's there. And, and the other piece is, depending on the, um, the reauthorization of the Rehab Act, that they're even looking at extending our support longer. So just anticipate that happening. Yeah. Well, and that brings up a point because I get this question all the time when counselors have clients that are um, already, they have a job and they already have the funding, DSP, DSPD funding, whether or not they should be eligible for our program or not. That's a question that comes up. And so, uh, you know, that's something I think that counselors need to be working out with and talking, having that communication with you, especially if they're on the waiting list and they don't have the full funding. Because eligibility is going to be, if they're on Social Security, then they're going to be eligible for our program. So we need to work together to share the funding and the hours. So. Yeah, that, thank you for bringing that up. But I know um, there's been a couple cases of DSPD full funding, for the lack of better word to distinguish those between the waiting list and those that are on the waiver. Um, typically folks on the waiver have a lot more hours that are that are in their budget or attached to them. Um, it seems like there's been a couple cases that they've already got a job and then they've come to VR and with the milestone it's kind of like, well you're not gonna get this the for referral fee and you're not gonna get the placement fee. You know, so it's kind of just, and so I need to do some education with support coordinators too that they need to be working with providers, and I'm not sure why that, because it's been a couple issues yeah. I know specifically um, out of this office, um, and I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, I think you guys all know that we have privatized support coordination now, so there's been a bit of a disconnect, I think, in terms of um, what those support coordinators know. There's some new ones. There's, you know, there, it's, it's been a big change for us, too, so I, I will coordinate some sort of training with Kyle or something specific around that. I mean, my role is to focus on the waiting list employment program, but I want to be a resource for the div division as a whole, so. And what, we, what we've done in cases where the client's already working when they come in the door is we've asked the counselor to sit down with the job coach, CRP, the job coach company, and, and the community service broker and, and figure out, okay, in terms of our milestones, what's most appropriate for us to authorize? And usually it's just, you know, we skip the referral. We, well, we're changing the name of that starting October 1. But uh, we skip that and we skip the placement fee, but then we move into the 20% and, and those others. So that, that is within a counselor's discretion to sit down and really figure out what's most appropriate. <coughs> and that's where I think as yes, VR counselors that with the brokers being new, some of them being new, that it's really our, we need to educate them too. And you know, we, we want the best interest for the client and bringing that team in together is really the only way that we can all kind of come onto the same page and have an understanding what our um, responsibilities are theirs and what's 
you know, appropriate. So that communication is really, really important for that whole team to come together. It is, absolutely. So ideally, um, the, you know, the cycle of a case would be you, you, you have somebody, um, I, they get identified, a broker goes out and meets with them, they get the paperwork back to me, I send you a Form 58, and then when you get ready for that 90-day closure, you send it back to me, and it says when the case is going to be closed. I then put a note for myself that that's when that person's budget will start. Um, I, I, I see a possibility, I'm not anticipating it, but I see a possibility with the milestone where they kind of get that 20% um, milestone payment for them as soon as they get that 90-day letter to say, oh, we need DSPD money when they still have some time left before the case closes. So I'd really like to know when the actual close date is so that I'm not paying for services prior to, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, I've had a couple where I'm like, wait a minute, you said you needed it now, but the Form 58 says the case isn't closed until November. And so I've said, hey, I confirmed with the counselor. Oh, okay. So it just kind of made me aware that that could be a potential issue. So it's helpful for me to know the actual closure date on those Form 58s. I have a copy of the Form 58. I'm going to pass these around to you. You guys can have those in your packet. But those can be generated from either end. That's really a back and forth kind of form that doesn't have to come from Tricia initially. Right. As you're meeting with your clients and you identify them to be on the waiting list for DSPD, that you know you can shoot this over to her. And we really want to educate the clients too. If they're not, if they haven't applied, then we want to encourage them to look at that resource if you want. Like. It is. Yeah, and you can e you can email me, instant message me. Hey, is this person on the list? I can check if I'm sitting at my desk. I can check really quickly to see if they are on the waiting list or if they're in um, full DSPD services. I can let you know who the support coordinator is, who that company owner is. I have we have a really great database that I can do that quickly, and we have um, I know we have a memorandum of understanding for the house bill. Maybe when we do that, when we update it, we could maybe add something so that we're making sure, um, you know, data sharing wise, we can do that. Yeah. Does Fernando have access to that information as well for our district? He doesn't have, not for the database, but he can always just check with me as anybody else can. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been the quickest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can use the Form 58 to check and see, but I can also just check informally. And I can also, I am your... Yeah, everyone has I access to mm -hmm. Is it easier for you to have one central person kind of do that rather than getting all those emails? Not necessarily. So I it's for, you know, like with Tricia, she's one person doing a heck of a lot. I mean, it's amazing to me what all you do. And so all that we can do to help in that process, you know, that she doesn't have to generate all this information. I just want you guys to be able to spend that, you know what I mean? If you don't know somebody's eligible for DSPD and you could use that supported employment money, that's a shame to me. And I know that there's several that have probably gone through and we didn't know or we didn't identify in time. So I'd like to avoid that that happening. So you had a question? Yeah, just a quick question on our, our Form 58 year. So you're saying you'd like to have this sent back to you at the, in conjunction with the 90-day letter. Mm -hmm. So who do we need to contact to maybe change that? Because it says for us to return to the referring agency at closure. Uh, on the 48? On the, on on the, the form 58. 58. I never even noticed that it said that. <laughs> yes, under part two, it says results of referral to DRS. Yeah, we can change that. That should help. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because if you're not in the, because you know, in our instructions within the training, we say you know at the at 90 when you know the 90-day closure letter period. But the form, I didn't even notice that the form said that. So thank you. Um, and even for traditional DSPD cases or fully funded, that would be good because then they can get their budget set up too, or any changes they need to make. So. Um, I won't go over each of the forms. You have a copy of each of those and who's responsible um, for filling those out. And then, you know, just some of the support resources. I've included the information about the TC40HD, which is the, the tax, state tax credit. 
for people who are on the waiting list for DSPD or in services. So I've promoted this to job coaches, to service brokers as another um, tax incentive to offer employers for people in this program. I just have to be the one that signs that form that the employers send in um, just to certify that they are in fact on the DSPD waiting list or in services. So that's just an added a benefit in the, to the, in, to the um, WOTC credit. Um, we do have something that, that I kind of bring up is the coworker support that DSPD has. It's, I want to say it's similar to, the, to your OJT, but it's, it's not. Um, I don't think it's designed as well, <laughs> for, uh, personally. Um, it's, it's set up similarly, these, similarly though, that the employer would be paid um, up to this 444 um, per hour to kind of offset support that an employee might be giving um, that coworker with a disability. Um, the challenge is that it has to go through a provider. So one of the CRPs, they have to be the one to pay the employer. Um, and there haven't been anybody that are interested in doing that because there's not an administrative piece built into that. So there's some flaws. Um, I'm hoping with the Employment First legislation that we can fix that so it's actually a service that gets used. But we do have it. Um, there might be a couple situations where it, it makes the most sense. If somebody works at a daycare, a lot of times the job coach isn't necessarily appropriate in those kinds of settings. They want to be the ones that train or something like that. Small businesses, I can see it working. Is it the coworker that gets that money now? Mm -hmm. doing the, actual training the, employee ha the employer has the discretion of how they want to do that. I mean, they could pay that, that coworker more money or they could just use it to offset the additional staff that m might need to support that person. They have the discretion of how they want to use it. Does that make sense? So anyway, just letting you know it's there. If you have somebody that it makes sense for, we could, we could see what we could work out. Um, it just hasn't been very popular. I'll just say that. Um, so a couple clarifications. The, the community service brokers can be used at any time in the process. Typically, they might be a little more involved up front when the person just gets going. Um, but they, if there's an issue, they can be called on to resolve something. That's something that, that we can use the money for. Um, you know, just people can unenroll from the program anytime if they don't want to continue to participate. We're again uh, being consistent with your notions of employment being long to, or not being temporary, things like that. The employment needs to be at least minimum wage, all those kinds of things that are the rules that you have around um, employment. So, again, I think we've identified some of the challenges that we have collaborating, problem solving, asking questions. Um, you know, just keeping that line of communication open. It seems like that's always the biggest challenge. You know, you get the information and then unless you have somebody, you kind of forget about it. So, you know, if you have any questions, go to Fernando or, or myself or Kyle, if you can catch him. <laughs>